so Wednesday was Back to the Future Day. I'm sure many of you know that. So congratulations, Portlandia. We're in the future. So let's take stock of what that means. In 2015, every single minute of 2015, a child under the age of five dies from diarrhea still today. And every single minute of 2015, another child dies of pneumonia. And these aren't problems that we fix in hospitals. These are problems of poverty in the household. Kids are born into environments where they're drinking dirty water and they're breathing in dirty air. Globally, a billion people still today don't have access to safe, clean drinking water. Two billion people don't have access to safe sanitation. And almost half the world's population still uses firewood on open campfires for their daily energy and cooking needs. Now, there are many efforts, small and large, from church groups all the way up to the World Bank that are designed to try to address these poverty challenges, but they persist. And two questions come up. How do we pay for these programs? And how do we actually know that they're still working after we leave? Before we get to that, I'm going to take a quick detour to NASA. Before I worked professionally in global health, I was an aerospace engineer at NASA where I worked on life support systems for astronauts. So how do we deliver clean water and clean air to astronauts in space? This is the Vomit Comet. It's NASA's weightless, when I worked at NASA, we had to call it the Weightless Wonder, but it's really the Vomit Comet. It flies straight up and down, we're weightless inside it, and we're able to test our systems that are designed for the space station. Water is too heavy to bring up into space to always have clean water available for the astronauts. So we recycle all the water every day. That cup of coffee that the astronaut drinks in the morning, her buddy drinks that same cup of coffee the next day, over and over again. We call this closing the loop. We recycle 93% of the water on the space station every day. Now in global development or global health, we have what I call an open loop system. Here's what I mean. Money comes in from donors. They can be church groups or charities, all the way up to USAID or the World Bank. And it goes into projects that are designed to impact people's health and livelihood. Water filters, cook stoves, latrines, other systems that are designed to have a positive benefit on people in developing communities and in partnership with those people in developing communities. But the money only lasts a couple of years. Almost all of this work is grant funded or government funded, but still programs that have a couple years of money. Under the best of circumstances, you may be able to afford what's called a randomized control trial, where experts will come in, epidemiologists or economists or engineers, and they'll rigorously study your program to see if in that time period you have impacted health, if you have reduced diarrhea, if you have reduced pneumonia, if you have increased wealth or employment. But inevitably, the money for the studies runs out, the papers are written and published, and everybody moves on. And this has led to great inefficiencies in delivering poverty reduction globally. About half of the water and sanitation infrastructure that's installed every year in developing countries is broken 18 months after it's installed, and in many cases never gets fixed. So we have a lot of work to do to make this more efficient and to close that loop to make sure that the impact on the people in developing communities is aligned with our actual intent. So our team here at Portland State, we haven't solved this problem, but we have a couple ideas that we've been working on for a few years. One is a business model. We can use business tools like earned revenue that tie our revenue to our performance and not our promises. And the other is technology, the Internet of Things we are bringing to Africa and India and Bangladesh. We call it the Internet of Broken Things, and I'll get to that in a minute. So first with crediting. When we install things like water filters and water pumps and cook stoves in developing communities, we reduce the use of firewood. In most cases, most people use firewood for their daily energy needs. In other cases, it might be kerosene or LPG, but inefficient, uh, emissions-causing fuel. We reduce both the use of that fuel and the demand for that fuel. As we demonstrate that over time, we're issued carbon credits by the United Nations that are tied to the actual proof of our impact and not the promises that we set ahead of time. We sell those carbon credits to international buyers. It's actually a $120 billion a year market, less than 2% of the entire market's in Africa. So we're among the few organizations that have hijacked that system for poverty reduction. We sell their credits to people that need to buy credits and want to buy our credits, earning revenue that we're able to reinvest in the program. 
So in this way, we create a closed loop where the impact of our effort is aligned with the inputs, with the revenue. And even the most hard-nosed businessman or woman will be motivated to maintain engagement, maintain performance over time. We've taken this to scale now in a couple different countries. A few years ago, we helped bring clean water to 4.5 million people in Kenya using this model. And last fall, a partnership between Portland State University, a social enterprise called Delagua Health, and the Rwanda Ministry of Health reached half a million people in the western province of Rwanda over a 90-day period. This is Rwanda. It's a country of 12 million people, about 80% of whom live in rural areas, many of them in poverty. Our team of nearly 1,000 reached half a million people in 90 days. On the map in the dark blue are the sectors that we reached, and in yellow are the control areas where we're running one of those fancy randomized control trials where we're directly measuring water quality, air quality, pneumonia, and diarrhea to see if we're having an impact. In green is what we're doing next year, another million people. This is a pretty typical household in Rwanda that we reached. We're actually touching the poorest quarter of households in this region. They're called Ubedehe 1 and 2. They're the poorest quarter of households in a poor region in what is still a pretty poor country. So this is a pretty typical uh, family. The stove is shown on the right side of the picture. It's still a wood-using uh, wood stove, and the filter's in the foreground. The stove reduces wood fuel use by about 70% and reduces indoor air pollution considerably when we get people to move outside. The technology is only part of the solution. Most of this is a public health intervention where we have to reinforce healthy behaviors over time to get communities to adopt them. And one big piece of that is getting people to move these stoves outside. The other is a water filter. You can take contaminated drinking water from springs or pumps or rivers, pour it through the filter, and it meets the highly protective rating of the WHO. So we effectively remove all uh, bacteria, viruses, and protozoa. In a, over 100 days, as I mentioned, our 1,000-person staff reached 2,500 villages. This is one of our distributions. Most of this work was done through community health workers, 850 community health workers that we partnered with and we trained who reached every single household. We've been in every household three times now in the past year. Those community health workers carry smartphones with them, so we have all electronic record keeping they scan the barcodes of stoves and filters. They take GPS coordinates. They take pictures. They take electronic signatures, all to allow us to monitor our own performance, to demonstrate to the United Nations how many carbon credits we've earned, and to help improve our program over time. As I mentioned, we're running one of those randomized control trials with some of the best epidemiologists in the world. And we have some early results to share with you. Now, our work isn't done, but if these early indicators hold, we're going to see a 46% reduction in diarrhea in children under 5, 73% reduction in indoor air pollution, and nearly a 28% reduction in personal exposure to particulate matter among children under 5. Again, if these hold, every single year we run our program just in the western province, not even expanding nationwide, which is our intent over the next few years, just the existing program will save an entire classroom of children from dying every year. In addition to that, we save 2,500 accumulated years of avoided sickness. This is a little bit of a weird metric. It's called averted disability adjusted life years. An engineer must have come up with this. What that means, one disability adjusted life year might be 12 kids not sick with diarrhea for a month. So cumulatively, we save 2,500 years of avoided sickness every single year we run this program. That means more time in school, or time at work, it disproportionately impacts women and girls who are equally susceptible to these, this disease burden, but also have to care for the sick, and also are the ones most exposed to indoor air pollution because they're often the ones cooking. So this program disproportionately impacts women and girls in Rwanda. Now, a big challenge with these health studies is how do we actually know if people are properly using these interventions? Engineers, like me, are really good at building water filters or cook stoves and showing that those work in the lab and can clean up water and can clean up air. And epidemiologists are really good at measuring health. They know how to tell if somebody has diarrhea, which actually isn't as easy as it sounds. But they figured that out. The messy middle is how do we actually know that people are properly using these interventions? Because in reality, most people will tell you what you want to hear. How many of you tell your dentist that you floss three times a day? 
So we use the Internet of Things, or again, as we call it, the Internet of Broken Things. The Internet of Things right now is about smart thermostats and coffee makers. It can be a lot more than that. It can shorten the distance between developing countries and developed countries and help us bring, in, bring us into true partnership with people in developing communities. Here's how we do it. Our team at Portland State developed a sensor system that we've put 1,000 of these units now in 15 countries around the world, and we have them in Rwanda. We put this sensor inside cook stoves, inside water filters, to directly measure use. Now, the real question, again, is are people using this consistently? Are they using enough water, and are they using it exclusively to actually accrue those health benefits? When we ask people, they tell us they use about a liter and a half per day, which is about right. That's about right to be having enough water for your consumption. It matches up against our surveys and observations. Now, when we put a sensor inside a water filter and we tell people it's there, turns out they're only using about a liter of water a day. Now, the real trick is when we hide that sensor, when people don't know the sensor is there, they're only using about half a liter of water a day. Now, on the surface, this is bad news. People aren't using nearly as much water or the other interventions that we've studied around the world. But it's also data that we've never had available to us before. Historically, we've relied on surveys and observations to inform whether or not interventions are effective. Now we can directly measure it and we can respond to that data. So that's an example of where we use sensors inside a health study. I'm going to give you another example now on the engineering side, on the infrastructure side. This is a water pump in Rwanda. Uh, if you can't tell, it's a broken water pump. But on a roster somewhere at the United Nations, this is a community that's being listed as having access to an improved water source. Over the past 15 years, the United Nations has claimed that collectively the international community has provided access to safe drinking water to 400 million people. Unfortunately, there's mounting evidence that as much as half of that gain is associated with water points that are not currently functional, and half of the remainder are contaminated with unsafe levels of microbial contamination. So it's possible that as much as three quarters of what we're patting ourselves on the back for is fiction. And the reason that's true is that the metrics and measurements that we use to measure whether or not we're doing what we intend to do are not in line with the actual impact. The measurement that's used today is whether or not there is an improved water source at the day we go and look at it. It counts the number of pumps. It doesn't count the liters of clean water. So how can we address that? We use sensors. Over the past year, we've installed 200 sensors across water pumps in Rwanda in three different groups. In one group, the operation and maintenance provider treated it to basically business as usual. If enough people complained, if it was close to the road, they could prioritize going out and fixing the pump. This has led to that metric I mentioned earlier. About half of water points are functional at any given time. In another group, we followed what we call the best practice model, or a circuit rider model, where technicians are paid to go around and visit water pumps on a periodic schedule. And that's the best practice in the field today. And in the third model, we have what I call the ambulance service, where the sensor itself triggers the notification to a project manager who dispatches a technician to go out and service that pump. And here's what we found. In the baseline, about 56% of pumps were functional at any given time. And on average, a broken pump stayed broken for over 200 days on average. Now, in the circuit rider model, they were able to decrease that downtime to about 60 days and increase the average functionality to about 73%. But it was only in the ambulance model where the sensors triggered a response where we, we were able to drive down the mean service interval to 20 days and got pump functionality above 90%. Now, we obviously want to drive this to zero, but even at 90%, good things happen. Other studies have shown that above 90% water point functionality, people are more willing to pay for their water services. I don't think any of you would pay the Portland Water Bureau if your water was only running half the time. And people in developing communities are not willing to shell out money for such an unreliable service either. But above 90%, you start unlocking the ability and willingness of communities to pay for these services. Another good thing happens above 90%. That's when you start accruing health benefits exponentially. If you only drink about half of your water is clean and half of your water is dirty, it's kind of the same as drinking dirty water all the time. Above 90%, you do have some resistance to that last little bit that's not clean, 
and you're able to accrue health benefits much more rapidly than below that. So all things being equal, and that's what we showed, it costs about the same amount of money to put in water pumps and let half of them decay as it costs to actually service water pumps if you put that in terms of functional months. It costs about the same, but you unlock these other benefits. So pictures like these make us feel good. Pictures like these have been used in the annual reports of charities and nonprofits and government organizations as evidence for decades. Pictures like these and anecdotes tell you nothing about whether or not these kids have clean water today. We have to replace pictures and promises with performance. We have to measure and incentivize impact and not just inputs if we're going to meet the intent of our work. We collectively, in partnership with developing communities, need to make sure that the day this picture was taken was not the last day these kids had clean water. Thank you very much.